All right, so in this video, we're just going to have a quick chat about distribution and retailing. So uh, one of the primary reasons we have a distribution chain is that it adds efficiency to the system. So for a minute there in the dot-com days, there was an idea that everybody was going to start selling direct uh, because the Internet sort of enabled uh, consumers to buy directly from a manufacturer and get shipped to their house and thereby sort of avoiding the these retailers that add costs to the system <clears throat> the problem with that idea is that uh, you know wholesalers and retailers and other intermediaries make the entire system more efficient so which drives down prices uh, so instead like it almost went the other way and instead of everybody buying things directly from manufacturers we're like getting everything through amazon at this point with who is acting as the wholesaler and the retailer um if you want to you know an interesting uh marketing movie about distribution is beer wars and it's it's available on netflix uh to rent or for free um if you have netflix might be on Prime as well, but uh, anyway, it's really cool kind of movie. It's very marketing uh, centric and looks at you know how the sort of distribution process from the people brewing the beer to the the few entities in a state that are licensed to distribute it to the retailers to the end consumer and what some of the issues along that process are. And talks about how the distribution chain and the retailers are effectively kind of used as a competitive strategy to keep small, you know, brewers out of the market. So uh, it's just kind of an interesting story. The stranglehold that Budweiser and, uh, you know, Coors had on the distribution system and how it took an enormous amount of effort for microbreweries to be able to crack into that system. So definitely worth a look if you get a chance. All right, uh, so there's a number of different types of intermediaries. Um, so we know I'm pretty much familiar with retailers. We also have you know wholesalers who you know and agents and brokers and distributors and basically each one of these uh, entities kind of adds a level of service along the way. So as the, as uh, you know things become as the buying process becomes more complicated and more pieces need to come together we need no, more players in this and one of the things the book does a good job of highlighting is that you know what <clears throat> when deciding like what type of distribution channel is the best fit for a company um, the key thing they're looking for is profitability of that distribution channel at the same time the, the players in that distribution channel are looking to work with other to be profitable as well so uh, you know, sort of important thing to think about when you're crafting a distribution strategy is to make sure everyone can be profitable. Uh, that being said, we do still have brands that uh, go direct. So uh, there's a cool acronym out there called DNVB or Digitally Native Vertical Brands. Um, and <clears throat> so the, I happen to be on this website, Tropic Feel, which sells travel gear. And I noticed they actually just use that, uh, you know, acronym sort of casually. Uh, like everyone is supposed to understand what that means, I guess. Um, but anyway, they're a company that, um, you know, sort of sells directly to consumers. Uh, retailers have a lot of different core competencies. So, so we talked about not, <clears throat> while well, somebody like Tropic Field may be able to handle all their manufacturing and dealing with the customers and shipping and all that, other companies need other players in the market to provide different core competencies. This idea of core competence came up in strategy. The idea again being that uh, if you can focus on what your key skills are and outsource those that aren't sort of giving you a competitive advantage, that can be a smart move. All right, so, um, you know, there's different kinds of store retailers. Probably most of you guys are familiar with these. Uh, I just did wanna point out um, some of the ones that are worthy of note uh, first is category killer so people don't really understand sometimes what a category killer is a category killer is essentially uh, something like in the you know Best Buy was a category killer at the time because they had more electronics than any mom-and-pop 
kind of electronics store had. Something like Dick's Sporting Goods might be considered a category killer compared to like small local sporting goods shops where you have just a few options. So anytime where a big massive box store comes in and has all these different options for in a particular category, this is drives out small mom and pops who are specialty shops in that in that area. So this was a, you know, I mean, this kind of came about, I guess, in the 80s, I would say, this idea, or 80s, or and especially then into the 90s, these sort of category killers came online and started offering these huge assortments. Um, <clears throat> arguably, they have been killed by Amazon many times because they offer more. Um, Amazon, of course, you know, offers like everything. So even because they're not constrained by a physical space other than warehouses. However, there still are people who are high in what's called need for touch. So need for touch people, they don't feel comfortable like buying something online. They want to go, they want to look at it, they want to feel it. They got to, they, ha they don't feel comfortable pulling the trigger uh, unless they can actually sort of be in the same physical space as the product. So for many product categories, Amazon is not able to unseat these category killers. The Superstore is a grocery store combined with a, you know, like a Walmart with a grocery store. And again, Walmart in general was seen as, is sort of seeing as a mom and pop killer. So they would come in, they have superior buying power. They can price out the smaller stores. And then sometimes they, we, in the pricing lecture we talked about, they were accused of predatory pricing, which is when you lower your prices to such a level that, you know, no one is making money but you know that you're a big organization so you can sustain the loss. And so you go into a market, you predatory price, you drive out the small businesses, and then you come raise your prices back up. Um, so that was something that Walmart was accused of, uh, you know, when they were coming in and sort of outpricing the mom and pops. Uh, the discount store, interestingly, so this was a category, you know, something that was a big issue with Walmart when they were sort of coming on the scene. Nowadays, it's Dollar General that's like eating Walmart's lunch. So now Dollar General has a lot of what Walmart has, you know, like the Superstore has, but has it really close to your house, right? And maybe even cheaper because they don't have, you know, they, you know the dollar stores, you know, cuts costs even uh, more deeply than Walmart does. And so... Now you have like Walmart getting com competition from Amazon, but also, you know, from these Dollar General stores. And so probably most of you live like, uh, you know, less than five minutes from a Dollar General, if I had to guess, right? So, um, you know, they sort of are competing by providing a different job to be done, which is just like super easy access to low cost general store items. Uh, factory outlets is another one I wanted to point out. So factory outlets are kind of interesting in that the sort of the legend around factory outlets is that, oh, we we had all this stuff at the flagship store and didn't sell. And so we're just like sending it off somewhere. It's last season's stuff and we're going to get rid of it. And while that may happen in some cases, more often there is a specific line that's produced specifically for the factory outlet stores it never has seen the inside of a department store or was never scheduled to go to a you know a flagship or anything like that it's just a lower price version of the product that's created for a different market so it's not unlike a um you know sort of a rate fence or a skimming or a product line strategy um you know, sort of line pricing, it is, it's just creating a different product. Okay. So people, there's a certain group of people who will pay full price at J crew and there's a certain people who won't, but kind of want J crew stuff. So they just create J crew outlet. And so they can price it differently for them and create a different line, but it's a different product as well. Even though that's not necessarily the narrative when factory outlet stores originally came out and the narrative when it written, when they sort of originally, came into the scene, it was that it was the same stuff, uh, but just um, overstocks and that kind of thing. All right, <clears throat> vending. So vending is big in a lot of countries. Japan in particular is known for having like amazing assortment of uh, products available through vending machines. And uh, you should kind of Google that sometimes, kind of cool. Um, direct mail. So catalogs are still relevant, which we saw in uh, you know the pre in the advertising section. Um, 
you know, they're able to create a little bit more tactical, uh, tactile, I should say, uh, experience than something like a website is. And home shopping uh, is still a big deal. So most of the products you see sort of pitched on Shark Tank are sort of the kind of products that would be sold in a sort of an online or sort of a home shopping TV kind of channel. Yeah. Lastly, I wanted to sort of talk about retailing as an experience. So we've we've mentioned like we're evolving into this experience economy. Uh, we have a lot of different flavors of experiential retail. So here you see the Apple flagship store uh, where you descend down into this basement and through this giant glass cube and you have the, you know you're inside of the spaceship looking thing right? people playing with the latest Apple devices. You know, are they are they making enough money to justify having this big place under in New York City? You know, maybe, uh, but maybe not. Maybe the per, the primary purpose of something like this is as a as an advertisement, right? So you're starting to see more and more of these of these kind of things where, you know, they have sort of this billboard effect or this sort of entertainment sort of experience effect. So here is. Um, if you're familiar with the jeweler Tiffany's, this is their sort of um, standard color. There was this movie uh, back in the, I guess it was the 60s, um, with Audrey Hepburn called Breakfast at Tiffany's. And um, so they created a breakfast, like a place you could have breakfast at Tiffany's. And so are they making money on selling breakfast there? No, they're not making any money, but they're like, creating this experience that people can go and have breakfast at Tiffany's and then maybe drop a few thousand dollars on jewelry on the way out the store. You know, sort of similar, we have, you know, this, this Vans has a store with a skate park on the inside where pe it's very Instagrammable and you have people, you know, taking their pictures and all this kind of stuff. Uh, some of these are built into stores and sort of permanent kind of installations. Uh, I think uh, where others are just sort of what you might call a pop-up. So this, I think, is like a Hermes kind of nightclub pop-up where they were like showing people making bags and having a party or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's sort of interesting, you know, if you've watched Stranger Things or uh, seen a lot of 80s movies, you kind of may have some sense of like what mall culture was in the 80s. People would go in these giant malls and sort of just wander around. Um, that experience still hasn't it hasn't gone away really i mean uh, it's sort of but it, it still exists in variety form so it exists in retail entertainment kind of experiences you know downtown greenville i would say is kind of a similar experience to what i remember as a kid in the mall we now take our kids there and like walk around and they find the mice and the mount there's little in case you don't know there's little like <clears throat> brass statues of mice hidden all over the main street uh, the mice on Main in Greenville, and they go find them, and it's just kind of like a an ex sort of an event. So this thing kind of, um, you know, it remains all of the things that you know sort of were there, uh, kind of are here still in different formats. So, and every time something comes up, like a Walmart or an Amazon that threatens to kill something, something else comes in and offers a different kind of uh, perspective. So that's kind of the you know how marketing is is kind of this evolution, and it's it's always good to think about this kind of stuff in terms of jobs to be done and how, you know, people can come up with new and, and exciting ways to kind of deliver on these jobs to be done.